Good morning. My name is Robert Miller, and I am an associate professor here at the School of Social Welfare. Um, to Ricky Fortune's class, welcome. Um, Fannie Lou Hamer, Barbara Jordan, and Mary Church Terrell believed in the promise of American freedom and aid to advocating for the promises found in the Constitution, particularly the First Amendment. And this idea about using media and freedom of the press in the service of life, living, pursuit of happiness is an ideal here. Um, I'm really grateful to have um, Ms. Mercedes Williams and Ms. Tamami Woolley um, as two of three of the panelists who are going to talk a little bit and share a little bit of their lives with us today. Um, I was just told that Elaine Houston's power went out and because that's true, her, like, her garage door won't go up to let her car out of the garage. It's a whole conversation. Um, <laughs> But welcome to Black Women, the Media and Justice, uh, Michael Wan panel discussion. I'm really excited about this presentation, mostly because I'm a groupie in some really obnoxious ways. Um, and when I get, I, and I'm a news junkie too. So being able to watch the news and to see people who look like me on the news is no small thing. And when I got here in 2000, there were only two black uh, news media personalities on the air at the time, Ken Scriven and Elaine Houston. Um, and as time went on, that changed. And there's a big deal, particularly when we think about what does it mean to dismantle or at least transgress um, white supremacy um, and white dominant culture. And when you have different voices and different people talking about things around issues that impact all of us, the varying perspectives are deeply important, right? So, um, as a practical matter, in the summer of 2019, during the whole George Floyd event, um, I was watching Spectrum News. And I, it was a Saturday afternoon. And I just turned on the television and Jody Kinney, Mercedes Williams, and Tamani Woolley, we're having a conversation around what does it mean to be black women doing news, particularly in really difficult moments. Um, and I thought to myself, that conversation needs to happen here. And it, it takes Hal Lawson, who's a former professor here, who says, it's a teacher who looks at everything, tries to figure out what does that look like for the classroom. So here we are. Um, to get to the point, I first want to introduce our panelists. Um, first. Ms. Mercedes Williams. She first graced Spectrum News Airways in 2018, yes? Um, a multimedia journalist at Spectrum News who can be found all around the capital region reporting on the people and places who make up this area. It's important to her to amplify the voices of those often overlooked. There are three things I love most and that's helping people, telling a good story, and fashion. I'm lucky enough to have, to have a job where I get to tap into all three. She told me not to ask the question about whether or not she made the, um, the, <laughs> the frock she's wearing this morning. Uh, I'm going to let her tell it. Um, after studying for an associate's degree in business in California, Ms. Williams moved to New York City to attend the Fashion Institute of Technology's International Trade and Marketing Program. Welcome, Ms. Williams. Thank you. Tamati Woolley is an Emmy-nominated television anchor, host, reporter, and producer with more than 10 years of experience in broadcast journalism. Kicking off her career in New York City, Ms. Woolley transitioned to entertainment reporting to local news as a freelance reporter for Spectrum News, sister station in New York One. In 2009, Ms. Woolley helped launch Fios One News, a Long Island and in New Jersey, in, New Long, in Long Island and in New Jersey, um, as her breaking news reporter and fill-in anchor the youngest of five children, the only girl, a competitive, a former competitive swimmer, and a Girl Scout at heart. <laughs> Apparently wanted to be an actress first. Yeah, I'm a researcher, that's what I do. Um, and went to college for theater, but fell in love with journalism. Um, as a personal aside, I first met Miss Woolley at a fundraiser where she was the um, mistress of ceremonies. And um, instantly, instantly, a huge fan and big whoopee. Um, 
Miss Woolley is a proud member of Double City Church of Charity. Um, uh, so when Miss Houston gets here, because I'm believing in, in, I'm believing in that. Miss Houston, in many ways, is a media giant for me. I got to Albany in 2000. She was one of two black anchors across the Upstate Network affiliate. She's worked at WNYT since January 1990, reporting and anchoring uh, for the award-winning news station. Today, she anchored, co-anchors a 5 p.m. and 5.30 broadcast. She was honored by Governor Pataki um, with the African Americans of Distinction Award for her contribution to the profession and the community. She's also the winner of another Governor Women's of Courage and Vision Award for her contributions to community and her profession. She's also received the Colony Chamber of Commerce Women in Professions Award. Um, she has received a whole lot more. Uh, and a huge fan of Tina Turner, has traveled to 12 countries, and we've both been to Tanzania, just not at the same time. Um, Again, when she gets here, it will be a huge honor to welcome her. So let's get to the heart of the matter. Um, here's my first question, please. Tell us how you first became interested in news broadcasting, and what was your first significant news event that drew your attention? Someone is doing the game. Um, so my beginnings in news was a little unorthodox. So like you heard, I went to FIT. And um, they had a radio and television broadcasting club there. So I was more behind the scenes. I would do the photography, help the students there, um, produce their videos. When they went to fashion week, I'd be like, okay, stand over there and say this or do this or whatever. So I just was really about putting those visuals together and helping the students. And then um, I stumbled upon this station because I moved uh, to New York from uh, California. I lived in Harlem. And uh, it was called New York One. And I was like, this is so amazing how it's like the station that's hyper local and really just cares about like the community and everything that's happening. And it was just so different from anything that I had ever seen. And so while I was in college, I was like, I'm going to apply for this place. <laughs> and here I am with my little fashion degree. And I'm like, uh, can I work in hard news, please? <laughs> and so the first time they were like, oh, we don't know if you're, you know, you've got the news shops for this. We don't know if you're right. So about, you know, three months later after the rejection letter, I was just like, all right, I'll, I'll figure something else out. Um, I was laying in bed. I think it was about like 930 in the morning or something. And my entire apartment just like shook. And I was like, what was that? And so I ran outside and I looked, you know, just down the block, this whole entire building, eight story building just exploded. And I was like, what is going on? So the first thing that I came, that I thought about, I was like, news, New York One, they're going to want something, you know? So I ran upstairs and I got my iPad and I was like, I was so green. I was running down the street and um, the police, I mean, it had, it had just happened. It was so quick. The police were still putting up tape and I was running up to the police officers. I was like, with the iPad, what, what happened? What happened? They were like, ma'am, can you please step back? <laughs> what are you doing? Um, but, you know, after that, um, I reported on, um, you know, like live on the air. I did a phoner because none of the other reporters were able to get even close to where I was. You know, I got, you know, so many visuals of, I mean, it was, it was kind of traumatic, but like just the video and everything that I was able to send in there. And then um, my mentor, Cheryl Wills, this is how everything is like five degrees of separation. I met her backstage at New York Fashion Week. That's her like cherry on the top. She's an anchor at New York One um, and she does that. And, um, you know, I called her up and I was like, look, I have all this stuff. What do I do? And she was like, we're going to get you on there. <laughs> and so I talked to her back and forth live, gave them the videos when they were finally able to you know, get the cameras out there. I did a, a live shot um, with them as like an eyewitness. And then a week later, I applied at New York One and they were like, you know, they took a building explosion. They were like suspicious. I'm like, no, I promise. <laughs> um, and uh, so you just never know where life is going to take you. And um, I started there. I, you know, cut my teeth 
It wasn't glamorous, even though I got the job that I wanted. It wasn't glamorous starting out. I cut my teeth and I was behind the scenes still uh, as a photographer, but it was all of those skills that really, really, really set me up and prepared me for being, you know, um, on air live in the market that I'm, in, that I'm in. Because it takes people sometimes so many markets to go through and so much practice before you can get to a certain level. And so um, that's, you know, how I got into the news business. <laughs> So funny, uh, Mercedes and I worked at uh, New York One together. Cheryl Wills is also my mentor. Um, highly, highly recommend find somebody who motivates you, who believes in you, and who will tell you the truth about yourself until you need to get until you get where you're going. Um, and she's a great mama bear for us uh, because she does not allow cattiness in the newsroom. She's very big on women supporting other women. Um, which is huge. So if you're especially a female, please find a female mentor like that um, who's not trying to put another woman down thinking there's only room for one at the top because there certainly is not. There is room for plenty of us. Um, and she was also really big of rounding um, the African-American girls around her, which I, I really loved because sometimes we're isolated even more feeling there's only room for one black person. And you'll notice the tokens around, <laughs> let's be honest. Um, but that's not true because excellence always rises to the top. So uh, I was a theater major and I fell into um, being a reporter through one of my acting coaches and it was through a video streaming company, but I was doing glamorous stuff in New York City. I was doing red carpet movie premieres and club openings and all that stuff and just living the life. Um, and that went under when the bubble burst. And, but I knew I really loved reporting and I really loved being on that side of the camera and talking to people. So I decided to go to grad school um, and I was doing a, an internship where, believe it or not, I got paid more than we got paid at New York One. How much was our, our hourly salary at New York One? They started me at $10.50 an hour. Yes. <laughs> In New York City, we made $10.50 an hour. But if you have a passion for something and you want to do it, you got to go and get your foot in the door and start and do what you want to do. I made more of my internship through grad school than I did at New York One. But I got in the door, and I got in the door not doing what I wanted to do because I had a reporting experience. Um, we both started out as news assistants, but it's okay because I knew we both had the chops to rise to the top and to work hard and to show ourselves and prove ourselves. So um, because of my internship, you know, I came in with the skills, elevated skills. So I was promoted to reporter within, I think, six months, definitely not a year. So between six months and a year, Really wasn't looking to do hard news, um, but you know that's just something like Mercedes says you have to cut your teeth on. Um, but you know what I love is that she followed me here. <laughs> um, is that you know now I get to go back to my love of doing things that make people feel good and feature pieces. I've never been someone who's like I'm a news junkie. I'm not. I shut off. You know I, I don't have time for it. I mean when you when you cover really hard stories, it does. Um, play on you. It, it does affect you. Um, so I'm really grateful now that I get to do stuff that I, people, you know, stop me in the street, be like, oh, I went here because I saw you, you know, you go there. That never happens when you're covering a fire or a triple murder. No one's ever like, thank you so much for telling that story. Um, but yeah, now here we are in a really great market. And I think making a difference, a bigger difference than we were, we would have been able to make in the city, I think. During your career, which news event moved you the most and why? I was uh, uh, a reporter for 9-11 and um, nothing prepares you for that. Nothing. Thank God I, um, A, God knew what I could and couldn't do. So two things I'm really, really grateful for in my business is that I've never seen an uncovered dead body, which is rare as a reporter. Um, they've always been in a medical examiner bag because I just know me. That's not something I could have ever wiped from my consciousness. So thank God they were always on a gar gurney covered up um, and that I didn't see any of the either tower fall. Like, I don't think I could have been okay with that because we're only human, right? Um, so, and I wasn't able to get close enough to ground zero to see the bodies jumping out of the window. So I'm very, very grateful for that. It was enough of an emotional toll for me to be close enough there to 
talk to the family. I mean, for, for weeks, you guys will understand, there were people, they would hold the picture of their loved one and just walk around and, and ask anybody, have you seen this person? I'm looking for my dad, I'm looking for my mom, I'm looking for my aunt. They would just cling and they come to any camera just crying like, can you help me find, I'm looking for this person. Do you know if they got them out of the rubble? Have you heard anything? Is there anything, you know, any place that they're, they're taking people, a hospital, that was really, really difficult because I think you saw humanity in a different way and to have your life so impacted by other people who meant pure, like pure evil was really, really difficult. And the temp, the pulse of the city was different. I've never seen New York City like that. Like, you know, people were just walking down the streets like zombies. They wouldn't look you in the eye. Um, and the energy of the city was really, really strange for, for a long time. And so that really impacted me. Um, mine was a little bit more uh, nuanced. It was when I was uh, still behind the cameras and working at New York One, and we were just doing a series of stories on NYCHA developments and the people living in them. And, you know, even when I lived in Harlem, by no means that I live in a nice apartment. I had like four roommates and, you know, at one point in time, I didn't even have a door. It was like a curtain. So, you know, that shows you how expensive it is there. But when you went to these NYCHA apartments and you would see, you know, the conditions that people were living in and kind of like adapting to, it was just mind boggling. I, I, a woman was uh, with her two children, I believe her niece and her daughter were in um, a bedroom and they were sleeping. And next thing you know, it, they, the mother was awakened by the whole entire ceiling collapsing in on them. All of the, I mean, it was horrific. It was like, you know, remains from, you know, rodents, you know, rat droppings, mold. And it's like these continual problems that they would say, hey, we need fixing. And all NYCHA would do is come down, scrub it with bleach and then paint over it. And then the mold would come back again. Or, you know, there would be lead, pipe problems or something like that and it would leak through the roof and, and and you would see where it would be leaking from a top roof down to the bottom roof and then they would come in scrub the wall and then paint it like how is that a fix you know and so it just was like this is a huge problem it's like do you tear these things down and then displace all these people that are living there do you come in and repair it for hundreds of millions of dollars because there's so many NYCHA properties and then in the meantime you have children growing up in that you know, um, it, it's hazardous. All of that mold and all of those things affect those children and the brain and, and, and how they're living their day-to-day -day lives. But just to see how it's just like, they're like, I guess there's nothing I can do. I put in a ticket. There, there were these things called tickets, right? You would call them up and they would put in a ticket. And sometimes if the people came and knocked on your door and you were at work, the ticket got closed. You know, it was just horrific. And, you know, to this day, that is like one of the biggest issues. And so anytime, and it really helped me understand like the microscopic problems of a community and how that just kind of makes a ripple effect and can affect children and can affect adults and the older people and everything like that. And so that's really kind of what drew me into, you know, local journalism. So NYCHA is New York City Housing Authority. New York City Housing Authority. New York. New York, yeah, New York City Housing Project. Yeah. <laughs> Pretty much. Thank you, Rio. There you go. Um, how do you prepare yourself to tell the news? Um, so Tamani says she's not a news junkie, and this is kind of unhealthy, but like MSNBC to CNN, it's always on in my house. <laughs> and like local news and I don't know, I'm just like always trying to stay on top of what's going on, especially on like a larger scale with the network television. Sometimes I even tune into Fox um, because you can see, <laughs> you can understand how those things might be coming down the pike, right? For a smaller community and how that will be affecting them well before it reaches them. And then you line that up with, you know, being in constant contact with community leaders and, you know, people who, you know, 
just might drop you an email or a Facebook message and say, you just never know. You just always want to keep a rapport with your community because essentially one community is not that much different from the other when you're dealing with certain issues. So, you know, if you're just keeping in contact with that and aligning that with the overall issues, that's how I kind of stay up to date with the new team. Yeah. I think you learn in this business that people all have the same basic needs, no matter what their color is, their race is, their creed, how old they are, their socioeconomic uh, status. You know, people wanna be valued, they wanna feel safe, they wanna know that their children have a bright future ahead of them. Um, and so that's been interesting in this business. Uh, and piggybacking on what Mercedes do, so we do two very different types of stories. Um, when I came up, I was uh, a general assignment reporter, so I was going out and doing, you know, hard news up here. The, the hard news up here is crazy, not like in the city. People have too so much different. time up here. Yeah, like in the city, you know, people just shoot you when they leave because they got to go. Tell up here, <laughs> yeah, up here, they have time to like chop bodies up and store people yeah. places. And I, I, I was like, like I, like I said, I, we did a lot of stories in NYCHA and I would be there two o'clock in the morning, you know, knocking on doors. Did you hear about this? Did you see this? Can I talk to you? Here, in our community, two o'clock in the morning, three o'clock, I would not step foot outside. It, it's, it's just totally like a yeah. totally different. And people have too much time and too much space between them. Although I was in the projects in Staten Island for a story and I was like, I don't think I should be here. <laughs> like I was walking up the stairway all naive and this guy was like, you out of the stairway right now. And he's like, when you knock on a door, go like this. <laughs> he's like, don't stand right in front of the door. Um, but it does come down to interpersonal relationships. And no matter what job you choose to do when you leave this great university and the great teaching of Dr. Miller, please don't underestimate the value of forming really solid interpersonal relationships. Because if people can trust you, you're gonna get a lot farther. So a lot of my job and my time, like when I go on a story, even though it's a light fluffy story, like at least 15 to 20 minutes, I'm just talking to them. I'm just talking to them, getting to know them, putting them at ease. You know what I mean? Building a rapport with them, finding little tidbits that I can and bounce off of. Um, and that's what they remember. And they're like, oh, you made it so easy. So when we start talking, it's nothing new. It's something you've just been doing for the last 20 minutes, you know? And even when I was doing hard news, you know, and, and if I never have to knock on another door and ask a parent for a picture of their dead kid, you know, who got killed in a wrong way, drunk driving accident, I'm good. You know, I can't tell you how many times I had to do, especially Mondays when I worked on Long Island, every Monday. Somebody got killed in a wrong way, drunk driving act. It was unbelievable. Um, so I'm good with or asking them, tell me about them. But still, I would never be like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'd be like, hey, listen, what do you want? What would you want somebody to know about your kid? You know, you have to just be really respectful. I was like, you know, if you talk to me, I will allow you to tell people how you want them remembered. It's not just about the incident. Like you get to tell us who your child was and what a light they were in the world. And that got a lot, and people were always surprised at how much I could um, get sound from people that other news stations couldn't. But I always approached it very differently. It wasn't like, oh, I need my story. I mean, there were people that would threaten other, you know, reporters that would threaten them. And But, you know, just tell me, who was this person to you? Why did they matter? And that's a lot different than, I just need you to, you know what I mean? So form interpersonal relationships. I would go out into the community one night a month. I would go to community board meetings, get to know people, let them see me, find out what was impacting the community. Um, and then here, I just, like, what, what would I wanna do? It always amazes me when people tell me there's nothing to do up here. I'm like, there's so much to do up here. But again, I just get to know people. I talk to people. I look and see what's going on. And so never underestimate the value of interpersonal relationships and realize that it can take a long time to build trust with somebody and it can take one decision to break that trust and you can never get it back. So I don't give out people's numbers or emails unless I ask the party first, hey, is it okay? Like even Mercedes, okay, Mercedes, let me ask so-and-so if it's okay. You know, because not everybody wants their information out there like that. So just remember that. It can take you a long time to build trust with somebody, but one misstep will break it. Social work, commercial, pause break. Translation from what Tamani said to initial engagement and, re and assessment, report building, engagement. Did you hear that? Yeah, exactly. Uh, 
Um, let's see. Thank you for that. Because you just did like this thing for us on a really kind of social work way. So let's keep this party started. All right, keep going. All right, here we go. So George Floyd. Um, talk about it as a black person and as a black woman. What was it like doing that? Yeah. So I just wanted to start this because Mercedes isn't going to give herself enough credit. Um, and she really does deserve a lot of credit for the George Floyd coverage that happened on our station. She is very engaged in the city of Albany. I think the trust that Mercedes has built with the community and with the police department and police officers is incredible. And it takes a lot to build trust and rapport in an inner city. Um, and I, because of that, she, you know, she had her pulse on a lot that happened in the city of Albany, which I think was the main hot point um, of what happened during George Floyd. You know, I'm in Clifton Park now, so it really wasn't up there. Um, and Mercedes was bold enough to go to our management and say, hey, this, you know, this needs to be a conversation. The conversation Dr. Miller saw was spearheaded um, by Mercedes. So I just wanted to make sure that she got the credit she deserves because <laughs> she would have undersold herself. But I'm sorry, repeat the question, Dr. Miller. <laughs> I'm gonna give it a minute because one thing I wanted to mention was, um, because just to go to me, um, I'm going to get to the question, I promise. This idea about paying attention, what was fascinating to me was thinking about the evolution of COVID. When it hit Seattle, and then when I heard that it hit New York City, I just thought, this is just a matter of time. Mm -hmm. And it was going to travel right up 87 mm -hmm. and down 90. And sure enough, and so this idea about paying attention and making the national local is not a small thing and has bearing in everything that we do, right? I mean, from healthcare to crime to any of those social problems, if they're in big cities, they're coming here. It's just a function of how and when. Mm -hmm. uh, all right, so back to the question. Um, talk about reporting on George Floyd as a black person and as a woman. I just wanted to give you a shout out. <laughs> I appreciate that. And that's why you're one of the best mentors. <laughs> um, honestly, it was exhausting emotionally, mentally. It, it was it was really tough. Uh, I think for me, uh, it kind of was like a, a snowball effect, right? So the very when co when when the pandemic came, like you said, um, my husband was in Italy right before they closed, right before, he's from, he's from Italy, he's from Naples, Italy, right before they closed off all international flights, he came back. So that was when everybody was like, okay, we've got to get all these protocols in place to keep all of our employees safe. So they told me just to be on the safe side, since he's coming back from Italy, it wasn't in a, in a hot spot zone of Italy, but you know, stay home, get tested. And I remember that first three weeks was already difficult in it of itself because I got a test and this was like in the beginning of everything. So they were losing things. They didn't know where the information was. They, they you know, I, I was like, I got this test like, you know, a week ago, what, what's going on? And I think it might've been 23 days straight I was in my house. And I just was like, you know, I've got to, I, 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 I've got to be useful. I mean, there's things going on out there. I've got to be useful, even though that I, you know, I want to protect everybody or I'm going to go mad. So I remember the last straw was when Ahmaud Aubrey was shot. And that's when I was just like, okay, I, I've got to do something. I got to report. And so I remember talking to one of the community leaders and cause she was going to be doing like a 2.45 mile run or something like that for him. And I said, look, take out your cell phone and just hold it landscape ways and just, you know, film a little bit of what's happening. And then let's do a Skype, inter you know, interview. And that kind of like was the start of my experience of like this whole Skype, you know, communications and stories and things like that. And you know, after that, I was like, whoo, that was a lot. 
and then George Floyd happened. And I'm just like, by then I, I was cleared, you know, the doctor was like, you've been in your house for almost a month. Like you can, you can go out. And it was just like one on top of the other on top of the other. And, you know, when Albany, for lack of a better word, was on fire, um, you know, it, it was just like, this is really something that no part of this country is not going to be affected by. And to process all of that as a, as a woman, as a black woman, it really took some compartmentalization at times, which I've never done. Like I've always told you guys, I've always got the news on. I'm always thinking of the next story. I'm always like, you know, reaching out to the community. It took some of that to say, okay, I need to step away for a bit. I need to just, you know, um, turn my brain off, turn the news off, turn the, in order for me to be, you know, sharp as a journalist for the next story. And um, that's where that conversation that we did um, at Spectrum, I was also inspired by New York One because they had one too. But that is essentially where that um, emanated from because I was like, I think as journalists, um, and, and not just, and it wasn't just black women as well because there was all types of journalists from, you know, uh, there was one woman who was getting pepper sprayed and, and uh, you know, shot with pepper bullets and stuff like that. We we need a space to say, okay, we are, you know, human beings too. Also, we have to keep professional and report what we are seeing and how do we move forward and how do we do that? And then on top of that, being a black woman, how do you explain your feelings, your lived experiences as in relation to everything that's going on? So I felt like having a diverse back, uh, group of people with experiences and um, news reporting was important. Because like Tamani said, she's more of a featurey person. I was like more boots on the ground. Jody's uh, the, the midday anchor. Um, we had our producer, Jade, come in. We had, she was like behind the scenes. We were like, you're going to get on there because all, you, know, you were involved in this too. You got to put all these clips together. You got to get these reporters together. You got to produce these shows. So I, I think it was really important to do that. And, and for me, it kind of like everything that's going on in your brain, you were able to kind of make sense of it by speaking it out loud, right? Because it's kind of taboo to sometimes as a black woman to, you know, talk about issues because sometimes you look at your look at like you're being biased or something like that. But there was no getting away from that. That situation definitely affected a lot of people and especially black people. So we had to talk about it. I think and it's so weird with John Gruden and everything that happened yesterday and kind of feeling like, you know, are we taking, you know, one step forward and five steps back? I think what was so incredible about last year is just it was a perfect storm of everything, right? So everybody was in lockdown. You know, there were more people tuning into TV, watching the news to hear what was going on with COVID and how their lives are going to impact, be impacted. And these images of George Floyd were shown over and over and over over right you couldn't escape it you couldn't say it was doctored like you were seeing it for your own eyes so i think the fact that people were feeling very vulnerable already because of covid and maybe had experience being sick themselves or someone they love being sick understanding the fragility of life um i think made that incident colorblind and because people everybody was like wow okay you know nobody with common sense can think that over nine minutes was, un, you know, a knee on your neck is not excessive. Like that's not right wing, left wing. It's not white, black. It's just common sense. Right. And you're seeing it for your own eyes. So you can't excuse it. Nobody is edifying that for you. Your home, you're understanding the fragility of life. You're scared, you're isolated, you're depressed. And I think people needed something to stand for. Um, so it was really interesting in Clifton Park. I know some high school students, a lot of them actually rallied and did a march. Um, and what was amazing for me was to see people of all different colors, all different races, all different backgrounds coming together to, to rally for our social justice movement, um, which I think just boiled down to, to humanity. But I do want to give a shout out to our to charter because they didn't have to give us that space to talk. You know, we're the most diverse newsroom in the capital region. We have you, me, Jody, Dan Bazil. So we have four African-Americans. 
Karen Edwards, Karen's new though. She wasn't here at that time, right? So there was four of us. We had an Asian reporter. And Saul, I think, was like on, no, I think Saul was gone by then. But even then, we had a pan-Asian anchor. So when you look at the, the landscape of the newsrooms here, I mean, there was a time Channel 6 didn't have one. <laughs> we were like, I was like, how does that happen? We have the Tri-Cities here. So we have a very uh, ethnically diverse newsroom, which I think is important. Um, I think because we see things differently. So I don't know if you guys are into sports, if you watched yesterday, the difference between how African-American commentators and reporters spoke about John Gruden and what those emails meant, um, as opposed to how the, the, their white colleagues spoke about it. It was very different, right? Because you have a very different experience. Um, so I'll give you an example. So I was anchoring one night and this has nothing to do with George Floyd. And this, there was history was made at West Point. And it was the first time an African-American female had cadet had um, earned the highest title you could be. I forget what it was, but it was like, whatever it is of all the cadets, she was the highest, right? Like, like the president of the student council. So I start to read the script and the B-roll or the video that they use for it was a room full of white male cadets. And I was like, wait, what? Breathe, breathe, breathe. <laughs> so I'm like, stop it, stop, stop. I'm not taping this. I'm like, this is ridiculous. I'm like, how on earth do you make history with a black female in the only visual you can show our audience is a room full of white male cadets at a computer? And I told him, I was like, just think about that. I was like, and then the fact that I'm the person saying it, <laughs> black viewers are gonna be like, is Tamani on crack? Like, what is happening? So I went out to my newsroom and I was like, who wrote this story? And I went to the person who I thought wrote it. The executive producer had mercy because I guess she saw Tamani's like, breathe, breathe, breathe. That she's like, he didn't do it, I did it. I was like, well, I'm a, I was like, I don't understand how I'm talking about this. And there's video of white men. Well, that's all we had. That's what I was doing. I was like, well, as a black woman, I'm offended. I'm offended. And I was because that was a very racially insensitive decision. So she was like, okay, we won't do it. I'm like, I know there's West Point. We could have big overhead views of a graduation ceremony. We could have, you know, images of, of the gate at the front that just says West Point. They could have put a graphic over my shoulder that said West Point. Why are we showing close-ups of white men, you know, in a room full of them for this historic moment for a black woman? So the next day, my executive producer came to me and she's like, can we talk? And I was like, sure, we can talk. And she was like, well, I just, I just, I needed a moment to calm down, but I just felt like you were calling me a racist. And I was like, do I say you were a racist? Because if I thought you were racist, I would. I was like, no. I was like, I felt that it was a racially insensitive decision, that that judgment was racially insensitive. But that does not mean that I think that you're a racist. I don't. And I said, and this is why it's important to have a diverse newsroom, because I'm going to flag something differently than if our white male anchor was reading that. It might not even have triggered anything in him. If we have an LGBTQ you know, reporter or anchor, they're going to filter something differently that we might not have deemed insensitive because they have a different perspective. So I think that's how, and I just say all that to say, that's how I think George Floyd impacted us, right? We're looking, we're like, oh my God, that could be our kid. You know, that could be our kid. Think about that. That's a very powerful thing. Or it could be us. Just because it's mostly Black men doesn't mean it couldn't be us one day. Um, but the fact that, and I think what occurred was that we were able to give a safe space to talk about it. And it wasn't done in a combative way, right? It was just a conversation. It wasn't one of those things like The View where you're set up to like combat and scream over each other. Um, I think, and I want to give, you know, a lot of credit to Charter Communications, but... I just wanted to give that little comparison. You raised a lot. Um, I'm struck by two things right now. One is this idea of the perception of bias and how you have to manage it as women of color. But I think it transcends everything, right? Because when white women talk about things that are specific to white women, is there an assertion that they're particularly biased given the subject matter? 
which is equally fascinating because that same level of conversation does not happen with white guys. What do people think about that? So we've been talking a lot tonight. <laughs> I'll pass the mic. So you know how I am in class. Uh oh, so. he's coming for you now. <laughs> I'm gonna leave Ricky's class alone just cause. However, people, so give me some thoughts about this, right? Because what are we talking about here? We're talking about the professional use of self. We're talking about how do we understand social justice issues, and we're talking about how do we, within our role, our function, and our purpose, make sense of those things, in light of being an advocate for our client. You understand where I am on this? What's not clear? Carly, I'm coming. I listen. Yeah, here we go. So give me, give me, give me some. Give me some. Give me some. And again, the issue here is how are we thinking about having a holistic body for something that's important? And yet that is an advocacy position. That's a lot. <laughs> well, I think it's really interesting as I was hearing you talk about this sense of trying to manage bias. Um, how aware of that you are and how unaware so many others are um, and how much that's ingrained in our society. Um, a manifestation of white supremacy and patriarchy and how in our role as social workers, we have to spend so much time unpacking all of what, how we've been trained throughout our entire lives, not trained as social workers, but trained from the time, you know, from our parents and our peers and our schools to recognize that our, our worldview is only our worldview. And it, it comes with so much, um, so many challenges, especially in working with diverse populations. Um, and I think about that for myself as a white woman, how many doors are open for me and how much um, what I might say in a certain space is valued over others. Um, and there's so much privilege with that. And I think there's so much um, weight that comes with that that we have to manage. And it's really incumbent on us to manage but it's always, I always feel like we're swimming upstream. And I think um, going back to the news as well, the, the recent Gabby Petito missing case and, and just how much we fixate on white culture, white men, white women. <laughs> um, especially young, beautiful, women. There's such a value that's placed on certain viewpoints over others. And I think we have to be aware of that and see it. And, and then only if we can see it, can we do something about it and see it in ourselves, but also see it in everything that we're being bombarded with all the time. Um, I don't know. I raise a point in part. I raise a point in part because <sighs> listening to the snippet that you offered, Tamani. Now, granted, you were a teacher, so that's a valued position. What they want to get out, but it took something for you to decide this is not okay. And I guess part of the question gets to how did you summon the courage? to speak truth as you understood it. Oh yeah, that's not hard. I speak a little bit too much. Well, 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 well,
the role of social workers, right? right? They're practicing how to be who they want to be. Yeah. So I guess it, how did it get to you? It, it, give me a little bit. I mean, I think I've just always been a very alpha personality, and I've actually had to dial that back, and I've actually had to work very hard on my verbiage. Even, you know, it took me a minute to sit at a desk and be like, okay, because I can't come out screaming, right? Because then I'm the angry black woman, and then everybody's defenses come up, right? And that's also a stereotype. Um, you know, and it's just how you phrase things to people. But I've always been somebody who's just stood up for myself. I was born that way, you know, and I have five, four older brothers. So at some point, you, you know, you just come out learning how to defend yourself when you're the youngest and you have four older brothers and you're always the target. But I think if, you know, there's something that you see that's in, that is inherent. And I think it also comes with age, right? Would I have done that at 20 something? I don't know, because you're feeling yourself out. You know, now I'm old and I don't care. You know, I'm too old, I'm tired. I've been in this business a long time. You know what I mean? And my work speaks for itself. And I think there's a value in that. Um, but if you do see an injustice, it's okay to speak about it because you're probably not the only one who, who would see it and feel that way. Say that again. I said, if you do see an injustice, it's okay to speak about it because you're probably not the only one who sees it or feels that way. One more time for the Holy Ghost. <laughs> <laughs> if you see an injustice, it's okay to speak about it because you're probably not the only one who sees it and, and feels that way. And I can't, and I really did have a flash of, oh my God, what would other women, especially African American women, think seeing that come out of my mouth as an African American woman? you know, with history, and, and I was just like, there were so many other choices that could have been made. And for me, the, the fact that the thought didn't even go through my EP's mind at that point, that the visual versus what was being said were a complete juxtaposition was just astounding to me. And this wasn't some 20 year old, you know, right out of college, like this is a person with with life experience, whose husband's in the military, who <laughs> was just like, I just, it really didn't, I really couldn't comprehend how that was made. Um, and I and I do want to say also that, you know, you guys are learning and there's a lot of societal norms that we're all going to be a part of, right? It doesn't, because you're a white guy, doesn't mean that you're inherently bad or inherently racist. And that's why I really did emphasize that with my executive producer. Like, I do not think you're a racist because believe me, I would have told you. Um, I think the decision was racially insensitive. And I think as long as you're up for and open for the conversation, that's all anybody could ask for. Because, you know, you as a young white girl are going to have a different viewpoint than I have. And maybe I think that, you know, you're entitled and spoiled. And maybe what you're doing is coming from a trauma that you had in your childhood that I had no idea about. You know, one of the best things that happened to me last summer was one of my neighbors who were having a barbecue. And she was like, Tamani, I have a lot of questions. And you're a Black person. I feel safe asking those questions, mm -hmm. too. Mm -hmm. That was huge for me. Huge. Because all we can do is have a conversation, right? Because I'm sure there's things that she would do that are racially insensitive that, that would really hurt her to do it and know it. But when you're ingrained in a patriarchal system and an entitlement system, you know, there's just things out there. So all I ask you, especially as young people, because I've been so impressed by your generation, like you guys speak up, you fight for what you believe in, you're fighting for gun rights, you're fighting for LGBTQ rights, you're fighting for environmental rights. Like you guys, I think, have the power to be and have been one of the most proactive generations since the boomers right, who would shut down campuses. You need to do a little bit more on student loans, though. <laughs> Just saying, y'all need to start shutting the campuses down. No, I'm not being funny, because this is the 60s, Joe Biden would have repealed them by now, because all, oh, right, the boomers would have shut these campuses down and had sit-ins, and the government would have had to listen. But just be open to the conversation. Just sit across somebody who doesn't look like you in the cafeteria, and just strike a up a conversation. Some of my best friends, we would never know that we have as much in common as we do because they're white and grew up in New England and I'm black and grew up in Delaware and they're Asian and did, you know, somebody's from overseas. But when that, my neighbor asked me that, I was like, that's awesome. You ask me whatever you want. 
ask me whatever you want because it starts with a conversation because you're not inherently bad because you're a white male. You're not inherently titled because you're a white woman, you know, or mean or something because you're a black person or a black guy. Just be open to the conversation. What you got, Ms. Williams? So by you doing what you did and what I see you do on a normal basis, she gets those scripts together, right? Before she gets on the anchoring desk. She was an anchor. You know, I just came into the role. And if she hadn't done those things or if I hadn't had mentors that I could call up and say, hey, I don't feel right about this. Can you give me some advice? I would have to navigate that territory you know, that you already did and, and probably fail at it or probably not do it quite correctly. But it empowers you when you see someone else standing up. It just takes one person to just stand up and say, okay, I don't think that that's right. And then it keeps in the back of your mind, all right, I need to be paying attention to this next when, when this comes up. Or, and if I feel like I need to say something, I can definitely say something because I saw my colleague do that and, I, and she did it in a way that was effective, right? So I, I think it is important that um, you do those things because you never know who is looking up to you and who's watching you, even if you aren't that person's designated mentor. Now, I wanted to get to uh, go back, circle back to what you were saying when your, your neighbor um, said, you know, I have a lot of questions as a black woman. Can we That's just, I, I mean, as, a, as you being a black woman and she had a lot of questions. Can we just go back to the way that it was done that made you feel comfortable and the difference between when you're in a social setting and you're asking a black woman or man about certain things, there, there's a way to go about it, right? So I just wanna just clarify, you know, because sometimes things are done under the guise of, right? I'm just curious, right? You know, um, and there's a way to actually want to know more about that, that person or that individual's culture because you um, want to respect it and, you know. Um, I think Dr. Miller, a, a lovely lady back there, did you have your hand up? Do I, I feel like I know your face. Ma Ma Margie? Margie, Margie. Hey. hey, I was like, I know that face, oh, hi. hi. New York one. No. Oh, another New York oneer. Five degrees of separation. Yeah. <laughs> oh, so yeah, so about your question about my issues, yeah, so I used to be a CPS for a long time. So I dealt with a lot of that with a lot of clients, you know, went to this woman's house, she has the biggest Confederate flag in her house and all these types of stuff. So you deal with a lot of that. So it's just that when you're advocating for, like, that's my job to advocate for these kids and this family. Doesn't matter what, you know, they may not have an attitude towards me, doesn't matter. I'm here for the kids. So I'm, I'm able to divide that and be like, all right, this is who they are and how they feel. So I'm able to, I'm not, a lot of people can't, but I'm able to do it. I've dealt with a young woman who was on federal probation for what she did to a black, to a black man. And because her whole family racist also, but I was helping her and the case and like she was in the shelter and all that. And I was helping her and her son and one of the case managers. She also she, she was like she she says good things about. She's like, oh really? She doesn't tell me anything. She gives me all this attitude. <laughs> she gives me all the attitude in the world, but she did. But she was like, yeah, she really likes you. I was like, oh, okay. So I'm doing my job. Yeah, I just make sure just to come here because especially when you're gonna be social, it's just here to help people. Here to advocate for them. Some people, don't have, some people do not know how to advocate for themselves. So my job is to put my best foot forward and helping everyone, basically. Yeah. And, and I do want to say it goes both ways, right? Um, uh, I have been very guilty of, because we're only human, so I'll be full transparency. Um, you know, I, I just don't want, uh, you know, white people or especially white males to always feel like, oh my gosh, I'm being targeted. Because it goes both ways. So I am good for getting to a story building rapport with someone and then I'll see something that says Trump on it and that no um, it, and it's you know like we're only human and automatically I'll be like oh my god they're a racist I'm shutting down I don't want to and my photographer god bless him we're like brother and sister he'd be like dude come on like that's not fair <laughs> you know what I mean like it's an 80 year old white guy like what are you gonna do he was totally nice to you for two segments like now you see a card that says I support Trump and like now you're mad and you don't want to talk to him so, you know, like, was he mean to you? And I'd be like, no. <laughs> um, so it does go, so I, I, I say that to say we all have our biases, right? We all have our prejudgments. Um, and 
you know, a lot of times I challenge myself. So I did a story in a Harley Davidson store a few weeks ago and these two guys walked in and I was like, oh, damn. I know. But you know what? I was just so nice to them. I was like, and I had all these preconceived notions, right? You have a leather jacket, you're in Harley, you're from Maine. Like, I know I, there's a Trump sticker somewhere. You're not going to like me. But you know what? I went up to them and I just started talking to them. They were the nicest guys. One was on a church trip and all this, I, like all stuff that had I allowed my pre preconceived notions of what I think a white male riding a Harley Davidson with a leather jacket, with the beard, you know what I mean, from a certain region would be, I would have denied myself that opportunity to get to know them, to involve them in the story. So, you know, it, it's full circle. So I just don't want any group here to feel like, oh my gosh, you're being targeted, it only happens to you. No, it doesn't. I'm, I've been very guilty and thank God for my white male photographer who can yank me up from a big girl underwear and be like, stop it. Like, you know, that's a perfectly nice person, even though they're a Trump supporter. And, and also, if for me, the, the George Floyd protest, what, what it opened up when you're saying like it's a two-way street, how many things, you know, were issues for, for black people? And so when you look at it on the other side, and because there was a lot of intersectionality, right, that came up to play, then you're just like, okay, am I being sensitive to the LGBTQ community, the Asian community? You know, it just really, it just really opens you, your, your mind up to say, okay, I just need to be aware of these things. And it goes both ways. Even though the whole overarching thing was Black Lives Matter, you still were able to step back and say, okay, well, if I feel this way, what about these other groups? How are they feeling, you know, um, that are just trying to live their lives? So I, I think if that protested anything, it allowed people to just kind of say, okay, before I do this or before I do that or before I make this decision, I'm going to stop for a second and think. And I think that that has stayed with a lot of people, even well after the protest, right? We, don't, we haven't seen big systemic change as far as voting rights and police reform, right? But there, there's always that mindset shift, which is also a very big important thing because that's, that, that determines generations. Because if you're growing up in a family that says, okay, well, this is how we think, and you don't have that person that takes the time to shift that mindset and say, okay, well, let me go outside this and understand, and this and that, that continues to go. So that's why you have you know, the different generations and like maybe this generation is more powerful than, because I, I started seeing shifts and roles when, when Obama came into office. So it's all a ripple effect. And you can't, you know, fix everything in a day, but you can definitely change your mindset like that. It's been striking to me in listening to these conversations, particularly when you all talked about what it meant to go to a producer, or an executive producer, and he said, I'm not a racist, and you said, I didn't call you one. One of the things I don't think we teach well in school, we, we, we're good for talking about white dominant culture. We're good for talking about white supremacy. We're good for going after a white male patriarchy, but I don't know that we actually spend the time to invite but specifically white men to think about, by accident of birth, what does it mean to be a male who's white in society to have all these things, ideologies or ideas thrust upon them without a way to deconstruct and to hear. Because on the one hand, you're trying to defend against some of the stuff. I didn't do that, I'm just here, right? And by, privileged by definition is what is assumed about you versus by accident, as opposed to what you actually did, right? I don't know that we teach A, how to respond to it. And I don't know that we teach how to manage it. And so for your executive producer to hear the conversation, say something about him, yes? Actually, it was a woman, which also really surprised me because a part of me was like, but you're a woman in this, even if you didn't get the black part, 
I felt the female part. You know what I mean? That's a whole conversation. Yeah, should have registered. That's a whole conversation. <laughs> Sort of That's a whole her. conversation. So I was just a, a little like, huh. But no, I think it's true. And, you know, and I don't too. And I, I, you know, like I said, that's why I was very clear here. Just be like, you know what? All of us have something. So I just don't want to come down the white male uh, patriarchy because, you know, you guys are getting your hand to you a lot lately. Um, and the things like John Gruden do not help. And that's why I was like, all that you can do is really want to hear and have a conversation and sit across from somebody. I remember, so I'll date myself. Um, MTV Music Awards. It had to be like <laughs> 10 years ago. And Bruce Willis went with Diddy. And they were sitting next to each other and dancing. And every reporter was like, oh, what project are you two working on together? Why are you here together? And they were like, we're, we're friends. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, there is no project. Like, we're friends. I like him. He likes me. We wanted to come to the MTV Music Awards together. I mean, the fact that, you know, for a white guy and a black guy, to, like be cool and be hanging out at the MTV Music Awards had to be more than just two buddies that liked each other and, you know, had a friendship. It was like mind boggling to me. So yeah, sit around. And sometimes, you know, if I'm, there's a group that I might be a little intimidated about, but you know, I always try and, and go and, and talk to people who don't look like me. And thank God I got that, you know, from, from my parents. Um, but like, the less you look available to me, the more I want to get to know you and approach you. And it's really, really helped me in my job. There's really not uh, a place I go to or a group of people that I'm exposed to that I can't engage with on some level. And that's important, right, for what I do. The only thing I didn't yeah, the only thing I didn't, I went to my first haunted house for a story this week. That's the only thing that scared the hell out of me. <laughs> it's Aaron tomorrow. I'm told it's must see TV. It's not fake. Did you go to Double A? No, I had, I went to the, I peed before I went in there, thank God. <laughs> my thing was scariest. Oh my God. But that's the only thing really that's ever intimidated me. You know, I can, I can go anywhere and, and, and talk to anybody. And you guys should have that comfort level too, because what I realized is that we're more alike than we think. We give our differences more power than we should. You know, and everybody has a bias. Everybody has something. Um, and it's just being aware of that and having the humility to, to want to do something about it. And you might meet one of the best friends you ever knew who on, on paper, you would never think you guys would be friends or have anything in common. But yeah, I do agree, you know, um, that we don't give white males a, a really safe space to talk about things where, I, I mean, do you guys feel like you'll be attacked if you bring something up? You, that's okay. You can tell the truth. This is school. You pay a lot of money to go here. Get your, but get your money's worth. Who, yeah, you give it a... Well, I, hi, thank you for being here, by the way. Uh, so I just, I've been kind of just paying attention to my own experience throughout this whole thing. And it's like this um, mixture of like adrenaline, like, oh, I really should say something that is, you know, uh, empathic. And then it's like, no, just listen, just listen and listen and listen. So it's kind of like this, you know, uh, kind of inner conflict of like, you should really say that, you know, an understanding perspective right now. And then it's like, no, you need to just shut up and listen. Um, so I don't know if other, you know, white men have really voiced that kind of inner um, kind of fight that they're going through with, with inside themselves. But um, I think that's really, you know, my, my voice keeps on saying, just listen, don't really speak out. You need to hear this person's perspective instead of acting like you know how to talk about it because you don't, you don't, you don't know what it's like to be a black woman. You're, you're a white man. But, and at the same time, there are so many universal kind of mutualities that we have. We're, we're humans. We're going to live we're gonna get old, we're gonna die, we all need food, we all need shelter. So there are so many kind of overlaps that I think um, build common ground. And at the same time, even though we can relate on so many things, there are certain contexts and perspectives that we have to, as white men, just kind of, you know, I, I, I feel the best thing to do is to listen. So I guess that's, that's what I'm coming up with right now to, to say. And I think you hit the nail on the head right? When during the George Floyd protests, we saw a lot of activism and allies. And there's a difference between all of them. They're all necessary. 
you know, that, that aren't people of color. But I think the larger message that we were trying to get out there is listen, think about your actions going forward when, it, when you are interacting in a space that is diverse and how that could have a ripple effect on that person. You don't necessarily have to always, you know, if you, I mean, if you see some injustice that, you know, is harming somebody right in front of you, you should absolutely speak up. But you don't always have to be on the front lines picketing. It could be something as simple as saying, okay, I know that, you know, my colleague or my classmate is dealing with this and going through this. Let me give that person the space. Maybe today I don't need to speak up. Maybe I can be quiet and just, you know, let that person have the space, let, let them, it's just, just the little simple things. And it seems like, I know it can seem like it's a lot on your life. I've heard a lot of people like, oh, it's, it's encroaching on the liberties and that, but just imagine how a person that has to deal with the mental trauma, because sometimes things might not always be happening, right? To <laughs> black people, we might not always be under oppression, but think about the mental trauma that we have to navigate in every situation, every hour of the day, uh, just on a daily basis. And what you might have to do is like maybe one decision that says, okay, let me give this person some space. Let me think about this choice or what I might be saying to this person that could have an effect. Just that one thing, it, it can make a big, a, a huge difference on somebody who is having to carry that load day in and day out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> of course. So I need to shift gears a bit, mostly because it isn't reasonable just to have my pals to have a conversation with me. Um, so I want to have a conversation about how you all think about using the news as an advocacy function. And how do you do that while maintaining a professional objectivity? Or am I making something entirely up? Um, you know, I think one thing our, our station does really well, but before I get to that, I do want to say, you know, I feel bad for men, not in, the, not in the horrible way, but I think society has progressed so much faster than you guys have been allowed to catch up, right? When you look at the women's rights movement, now you look at the Black Lives Matter movement, like we've progressed really quickly in a short amount of time, and it's been really hard especially for, I think, for white men to catch up. And it's not that you can't, but there's just a lot of changes happening in a really short time. So I have to imagine um, that shift is really hard to navigate, which in my opinion is why I think Mad Men was such a hit. I think it was like a little, like, like a little dopamine hit, like, oh, the good old days. Like when we could be misogynistic and smoking a thing and the little women were home I and this I and that. I think every episode. Yes. <laughs> But that, that's why I say it's just a conversation and giving space and talking to someone who doesn't look like you, because it's really not fair to expect, you know, like this cataclysmic evolution in such a short amount of time when so much has changed around you. Um, but going back to advocacy, you know, I, our station has done a really good job of still um, doing journalism, right? So we are still expected to honor both sides of a story. Um, because there's always two sides to a story. So we're not very much commentators like you see on CNN or Fox, where it's just talking heads who have a very definite point of view who are just spewing that to the point where they brought in, who went to every station, a consultant who broke down pre-election how we were to cover the election, what true polling meant, what unbiasedness meant. I mean, you know what I mean? We all had to sit through this training at every station throughout um the footprint which i thought was great i'm not i'm not really into politics but i was just like okay so while we can advocate and why we do have that voice which i think some other stations might be afraid to to tap on we are still very cognizant and very aware of there's two sides to every story and that there's a human element to every story right it's always about people and that's what we come down to our station. It's about people, it's about their experience. And if you tell it right, no matter who you are, what race you are, what gender you are, what age you are, most likely you will see some of yourself in that person and their experience. Um, 
And I think that's what allows us to, to find that balance is that, you know, we're not just going for the sexy soundbite. We're really trying to give you a character driven story and an emotionality um, that you can understand and relate to on some level that's going to connect to you uh, on an emotional level that you'll be able to see yourself in. And through that, I think there's a natural advocacy, right? Where you can empathize with someone. Empathy is a very, very powerful emotion. Um, and it's greater, I think, than just a straight visceral emotional reaction, which I think a lot of the news out there tries to give you right away or drive the narrative, even like inside edition. Like, you know, they just make things so extra. And I'm like, just freaking tell the story. It doesn't have to be so like, you know, flashy. Um, but I think that's what works for us. Um, yeah, just, I think that to keep in mind as a journalist, we, we are there to document history. Like you can go all the way back to bloody Sunday, right there. It, it was very clear that who stood on what side you had the activists and you had the, the police officers and they both were, you know, drew, drew the line in the sand on and, and thought that they both were right. So if it were not for those photographers or reporters or whatever that caught that scene that day, we couldn't look back on history today and say, okay, we clearly know who was on the wrong side of history and how can we learn from that? And how are we maybe falling back into that path to repeat those same mistakes again? And I think for me as a journalist, whenever I see those things and I see history, it kind of gets me to take myself out of the story a little bit, step outside because these things can live forever and really understand what I am presenting to viewers and make sure that that is adding value to them and information that they can use and um, that is accurately documented. I wanna do a social work commercial break again. And this idea, Oh, stay there. Don't, don't, because I'm going to forget this right now. And if you forget, it's five minus five. Um, so the issue is character driven. I'm thinking about this because you all are coming up on assessments. And what does it mean for you all to be able to hear the story? Right. And ultimately, it is about the person. Right. So if you can, under, I mean, so you're going, you're going to have the assessment document. We're going to talk about this ad nauseum. You'll have the assessment form. But the question is, who are you listening for and why? And how do you hear the heart of the matter of the person you're sitting in front of? Okay. Um, uh, hi. <laughs> Thank you so much for your time and presence today. I have a little bit of a follow-up question. I've been thinking about this a lot for the last couple of years, uh, since 2016, basically, on how news has changed in my lifetime. And I wanted to ask you about news as a business, especially in light of social media and how you're competing for attention. Um, and in that, I appreciated so much what Mercedes, you were speaking to about historical narrative and having a real sense of responsibility because I don't see that very much, um, especially the talking heads thing and that kind of, you know what I'm talking about. I'm wondering, I just want to hear you guys speak to that a little bit. Um, advertising business. I think New York One is publicly funded. No, it's not. Well, even better on them then. Um, and I'm also wondering, so speaking to that, and then I'm also wondering if there are stories that you all yearn to tell that you feel like the time is still coming for, or, you know, like, just wanting to get a sense of that too. Thank you. That's a really, really, really good question. Thank you for that. So I think, um, so interesting fact, the business got deregulated um, by Colin Powell's son about 13 years, 
years ago, somewhere between 13 and 15 years ago. And what that deregulation did was it was it allowed um, single owners to own multiple news outlets in a single market. Before that, the regulation did not allow that. So Rupert Murdoch would have not have been able to have, and Sinclair would not have been able to have, and Disney would not have been able to have as many you know, stations, newspapers, all that stuff, all in one market, right? So that constricted uh, the amount of people that you were able to get your information from. To me, that's very dangerous. When you have a select few, I think right now it's three major companies. I think it's Disney, Viacom, CBS, and NBC Universal, and then Murdoch. Um, I think Sinclair. So there's a handful now who really, when you think about it outside of social media, control all the information that you're getting. It didn't used to be like that. There were a lot of family owned and operated stations. There were a lot of O&Os, which were, that's owned and operated um, by NBC, but still had pretty independent um, management, right? So now you have stations like with Fox stations, with Sinclair stations, where they have mandatory reads, which means whatever narrative the parent company wants to put out there, they send a memo in the morning to the news stations. It trickles down to all the stations and they have to read that. Some news directors are bold enough to say, okay, yeah, we have to do it, but we'll push it you know, at a certain place in our show. Um, so that deregulation really, really to me, did a lot to damage the industry because it consolidated where the information was coming from. And of course, the richer, more powerful corporations were able to buy up all these little stations and now have a bigger voice. So that's an issue. Also what it did was news used to be a public service, right? It used to be straight, no chaser. We're gonna give you the information. It's your job to figure out how you wanna disseminate that and what it is you think of it, right? News is no longer a public service. As you said, it's a profit on a line. So if you're NBC Universal and you have amusement parks and this and that, where does local news fall on your, you, you know, your budget and your priority list? It's now just a profit line, right? So how much is this getting me? So, you know, they're doing a lot more with less and what's gonna, you know, get the highest advertising dollar? Um, so to me, that's all very dangerous. I don't see it going back at this point. You know, the companies that hold all the power are way too powerful and have too many lobbyists. Um, and I think that's unfortunate. I also think that just like what you've heard, if you were paying attention last week with Facebook, where, you know, we're emotional beings, right? When we have a strong reaction to something, a lot of times we don't think before we pull, you know, before we react. So that's why Facebook, you know, would put all that allegedly inflammatory <laughs> information at the top, right? Because it, it like, like with me and my EP, like, oh my God, what? How can you do? Oh, I literally had to sit there and be like, just breathe. How am I going to take this? But it's easy to hit like or put a comment down really quick. And then before you know it, it's out there. And now your algorithm has triggered other things. And then you just keep this emotional height. Well, yeah. The more you click, the more you like, the more advertising dollars they're able to get for that. Um, the same thing with Fox and MSNBC. You'll see, and sometimes I do it just for fun, not often, but I'll, I'll just switch between the two to see, okay, here's a topic of the day. How is Fox funneling it? How is MSNBC funneling it? How is CNN funneling it? And I do think that the advent of 24-hour news was not in our favor. Right, because now you have to figure out how there's so much there's only so much news in the day. I mean, at the end of the day, there's only so many topics that are going to be a part of a newscast. But now you have to figure out how to re-engage an audience every half hour with the same information that you had six hours ago. So how do you do that? How do you spin that? Because you have to spin it. It can't just be the same thing because then the person's gonna be like, well, I already saw this. You know, when you think about somebody watching one of those 24 hour stations and they're telling you they watch hours of it a day, it's not because they're hearing the same like monotone, wah, 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 you know what I mean? They're getting something that is triggering them, you know, every half hour to, to, to stay with it. And I think what's happened now, one of the classes I teach is I, there's a difference between commentary and journalism. 
right? And what you get now is commentary. It's not journalism. It's not giving you just the facts. It's not not editorializing the information that you're given and allowing you to make the decision for yourself. It's very pointed in getting you to have a certain reaction to the information that's given and to have a certain viewpoint. So I think the consolid the deregulation, the consolidation, um, the now going to a profit line, you know, on a large spreadsheet where there's a whole bunch of other income sources um, and the advent of social media and having to compete with that uh, is, is where we are now. And I don't think it has done our industry any good, which why I think, again, you know, the fact that Charter has kind of taken the line it's taken is interesting. How many of you own a television? Can you raise your hand if you own a television? Really? That's more than I expect. Yeah. I didn't expect any of you to own a TV. I thought everything would have come on a phone or a tablet or a, a laptop. Wow. <laughs> So what were you saying? Oh, okay. We need our so it's the same. <laughs> uh, with that being said, that is the reason why I gravitated so much towards lo local journalism and um, Spectrum News and New York One because they value your input as a reporter on what you think is the story that's happening in, and it's important to the community, right? Because you're supposed to be connected to that community. So it's not a, you know, sensationalism fight or battle like you would have at a newspaper that can only get a couple words on. And, you know, you've got so many different pundits and commentators and reporters that ha are fighting for space that have to make their story sexy in order to get it online. Um, we're 24 hours and we're telling, we have so many people in our community and so many stories that we can tell that that's how we fill it up, right? And we opened it up to, you know, be, I like the way that we've opened it up to be more of like a statewide and, and nationwide model. So we're pulling stories from Texas sometimes, we're pulling stories from Florida sometimes so that everybody can get a little bit so you're not just in like a New York bubble. Um, but that's really what I've liked about it. And I really felt like, I felt that, you know, that flex and 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 um, and just being able to do that when the George Floyd protests came along. Because before then, I would pitch stories and I would go out and I would talk to the community. But like, it was it was amazing how my whole you know, paradigm of journalism kind of shift. And I'm not saying that I was like doing every story around social justice issues and George Floyd, but it was just like, oh my gosh, you know, I have this autonomy to like go out and say, for instance, I want to talk to uh, a, a mother whose son, you know, just graduated like with the highest honors and he's going to invent this. Or uh, one of my favorite stories, there was the Albany uh, Victory Gardens with that kid who wanted to be an engineer. And he just went up to the garden one day and was like, look, can I just work for the summer. I, I want to buy a laptop so that I can, you know, get my CAD designs out or whatever. And just telling those little stories, how many kids that will inspire. And um, I don't know. That, that's why I like working for Spectrum. And I, I don't know. I, I, I have people ask me all the time, like, do you see yourself at CNN and MSNBC? And I'm like, you know, the money would be nice, but your soul, like, you know, would I be happy? <laughs> you know, I mean, I don't know. I just feel like that's really, really. Yes, the money would be very nice. Fabulous. I wish they could bring that into local journalism. Into local journalism. And you would see, I mean, if they could do that, you We're would having a moment. We're incredible. all touching and agreeing. I mean, uh, yeah. I can feel it. Amen. <laughs> Amen. You would see some incredible stuff. <laughs> so let it be said, so let it be done. So part of this is thinking about, and here we go thinking about this country, thinking about the Constitution, thinking about how we have enshrined the free press as part of our worldview, right? That has changed dramatically. My name is Charter, my name is NBC and all those other things. So there's one set of conversations around the, the permanency of the press as it were, whatever that means. Um, but I think this is the crux of the question and this is what I want to have a real conversation about now. 
I have a group of people here who are interested in justice. I have a group of people here who are interested in crafting a better civil society. I have a group of people here who suffer me three hours a week um, in the service of becoming who they fully are. Huh? I'm really interested in how they can learn from you all how they can help do their job. And part of the work is how do we strike a relationship between social work and the media in the service of their clients or in the service of what we hold as important related to social justice? I think it's, I think it's all about reaching out to your local, your local reporter. And even if you don't hear back from them the first time, reach out to them a second time, reach out to them a third time, keep those issues on their radar. And um, I mean, because those are the things that we look for and those are the, the things that are important to us because we know it's important to the community and anything that could be helpful and shift something out of a bad situation or a bad spot, that's how anybody, you know, whether you're a social worker or just someone living in the community can make their stories valuable and form a connection with journalists. First of all, I want to say shout out to you. Social work is not easy. It's definitely a matter of the heart. I say God bless all of you. Um, no, seriously. Um, you know, I'm a foster parent and, uh, you know, it's been one of the most glorious and one of the hardest things I've ever done. And God knows you guys aren't going to get paid enough money to do it. And, you know, you're pulled so between a system that's failing, you know, biological families that are whatever, you know, the needs of the children. So, you know, I just want to give you guys, give your, actually give you guys a, self, a round of applause, honestly. No, seriously. You guys are deserve it. God bless you for being social workers. It is work of the heart and you guys are not going to get the credit you deserve. So take it now. God knows you're not going to get the money you deserve. I touch and agree on you too. Um, and you know, it's so funny being a part of this system. There's so many things that I'm like, oh my God, there's a story here. You know, I, I, there's a story here and there is. And, you know, I wish I was the person to tell it. I, it, I don't think I'm going to do it now. What's the story? Uh, just the, the failing of the system. Uh, the, the shortcomings I see in the system, you know, the, the lack of voice for the children. I'm so amazed at how little power these kids have in their lives. And the, the and who slips through the cracks. Who slips through the cracks. Yeah, how much power the parents who lost the kids in the first place are given. Yeah. Um, and, you know, these kids have a right to have a voice. You know, their feelings should matter. It should be more than just people who are biologically able to birth children, being able to continue to make questionable decisions that affect another human being who's going to go out into a life cycle that if it's not interceded at the right point by the right person and they don't have the right emotional makeup, right? That you just see the cycle, <laughs> like you just see it coming right back around. Um, and that's a very hard thing to walk through. It's, it's a very hard thing to walk through. Um, but you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't trade, you know, the girls that I have for, for all the, all the tea in China. And speaking of racial things, they gave me two white dog foster daughters. <laughs> and I was like, Who's going to ask if I'm their nanny? But it hasn't happened. So see, there's hope in the world. Girl, I'll give it time. Um, <laughs> so I can't help myself. So, and I'm going to say it the way I mean it. Should and when you become ready to tell that story, mm -hmm. come here. Okay. Help, let us help you. Yeah. I mean, I would love it. I, You know, my therapist, because I believe, I mean, going through this process, I need therapy. Yep. yep, yep. Um, and I say, Thank and that. please, as you guys, and I tell anybody, I was in therapy long before this. Um, I believe in therapy. And I think if you're not in therapy, something's wrong with you. I really do. And as social workers with what you guys are going to have to experience emotionally and go through, please, please have somebody to talk to. Say it again. Please have somebody to talk to. Don't underestimate. Please have somebody to talk to that does not make you weak, 
It doesn't mean you can't do your job well. It doesn't mean something's wrong with you. It means you are a human being who cares. And you don't become a social worker unless you care, which means you're very tender hearted, which means things are going to affect you more than you think they will. And you are going to need that person to bounce things off of, to stay balanced and to stay okay. And it's okay to get that help for yourself. You know, the clinician that I that works with my girls um, gets therapy and is very honest with the girls about that because they they need to know that, you know? And I went back to my therapist that I've had since 17. It's okay. And I just really want to say that again. It's okay. And my therapist said, Tamani, here's your book. She said that to me. When she hears when she's like, here's your book. Um, because we have to do better. We have to do better by these kids. I don't know what the answer is. I don't know where to start. Maybe, you know, there's one line that I'll put down that might trigger something, but you guys and your experiences are gonna matter too. And I was like, I wish there was an investigative journalist or like somebody, you know, I know people like in long magazine forms that could really sit down and maybe look at multiple generations and really give people an understanding of what happens in the system. Um, and New York is a strange bedfellow because, you know, it's so liberal here. And on some ways that's a blessing. And on some ways it's a, it's a curse. Um, and the Families Rights Act that was passed, I think within the last year, yeah. you guys should look, are you studying that in this class? You should, somebody needs to do a paper on that and how it's changed um, the dynamic for these kids. Um, because it's really, really interesting. But I'm sorry, I got off on a tangent. And I for, again, once again, I forgot what the question was. So the question gets at how do, how can social work and media um, use each other? Yeah. In terms of yeah. Just kind of get the I really wish you guys could find an investigative journalist who could really spend the time it needs to tell the stories that need to be told about the system and the children. We really don't have investigative journalists in this, um, in this realm, I think the power of blogging is really good. Um, I think the power of podcasting, and I was actually like determining if there's maybe just a podcast I should have about fostering so that people know you're not alone. One thing you feel like as a foster parent is you feel very alone and very unsupported often. Um, so I think what you guys have uh, is the power of social media that you can use for good. And that is a beautiful thing to have in your hand. You can make a difference by giving a safe place for foster parents to speak, for bio parents who may be, because they're not all bad. You know what I mean? Some of them are doing the best that they can for children um, you know, when the person I talked to who's in the system says one of uh, their kids said, when they get older, they want to come up with a law that gives children a bigger voice. You know, that's a really powerful thing for a little kid to say when you think about how much they're bounced around. Um, and I'm assuming, does this mean they're going into like things like the foster? So we're going into everything. Some of it's like me, for example, I don't do kids on purpose. Okay. Mostly because I love them, but they would put me in jail for the parents. Yeah. So I just know that about myself. So right. I do HIV instead. So that's all I got. Right. Um, but they have all, everything's here. Everything's here. Okay. Everything's here. Yeah. So child welfare, child policy, yeah. uh, direct practice. Um, child child policy, policy. All please look in? into that Family uh, Rights Act that just passed. Please look into what we can do to give. To, I mean, I just find it interesting that a kid can be eight years old and have to talk to the judge about their case but that you don't give them any other power in their life. So it's okay for you know this judge they've never met to be like, okay, who do you wanna live with? Where do you wanna go? What do you want for your life? <laughs> you know what I mean? But then other things that they should have the right to say, I'm not comfortable with that, or I don't wanna go with mom or dad this day or whatever, um, doesn't get appreciated or adhered to. Like that's very weird to me. But I, I think blogging, because somebody needs you, no matter what element of social work you go into, somebody is hurting, somebody is broken, somebody needs to know they're not the only one feeling that way, someone needs to know there's help, someone needs to know there's support. 
Um, so I would say use the journalism that you have at your hand, which is blogging, uh, maybe a YouTube channel, maybe a podcast, where you can provide that information and provide that safe space and let somebody know they're not the only one going through something. Maybe it's other social workers, because what's the realm? I think in foster care, I think it's like two to three years is tops for most because they get so emotionally burnt out. Who's supporting you guys? You know? That's how I would utilize it. Ms. Williams, what you got? Going back to mental health, um, I want to reiterate that again. Make sure that you are in contact with someone professionally. I mean, as well as friends and family, that could be good too. But the, the difference between talking to a licensed therapist or psychologist and following the advice that they, they give you, and, you know, understanding that they went to school for that, just like how you guys are going to school for it. And, you know, you're becoming experts in the field, understanding that. Um, and then really monitoring your emotions. I, I know for reporters, when you get to that point when, because sometimes we'll joke and say, oh, I'm numb now, or I, you know, I, I feel like desensitized. When, you, when those words come out of your mouth or you get to that point, you have to say, oh my gosh, let me take a step back. Because when, when you're not feeling those emotions and you're not, those are your cues to let you know something's right, something's wrong, something needs to be investigated, something more needs to be done. And when that's off, that means that there is a heavy baggage of trauma or you know, mental things that are going on that you need to get addressed so that you can be in tune with that and you can feel those emotions. Emotions are very important, you need to feel them, whether it's happy, sad, angry, you know, you have to go through the gamut. It's such a, it's such a terrible thing that people say that, you know, oh, the fear and the anger, and I mean, everything in moderation has to be felt because that's what guides you. So I just wanted to reiterate that as professionals, we're kind of like aligned as reporters because we see so much stuff. Tamani says she didn't see a dead body, I did. and. When I was working at New York One, you know, we're sent out as photographers. I, I was working in a position as a news assistant, and you don't know what you're going to see when you get to um, certain scenes. And um, I had to definitely, that's when I discovered therapy. I definitely had to get into therapy because it was such a new realm for me. I needed to discuss what was going on because, I mean, it's equivalent almost to like, you know, seeing things in war and you're not even connected to it. So you're not, your brain is like, I see this, this is like not television, this is not a movie, and this is real. Things from, I, 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 maybe I shouldn't tell you this, but you know, when they would send me, the desk would send me to, they, they had a habit sometimes of sending you to a funeral, maybe somebody of the family wanted to speak out or tell their story. I would just be like, I'm not talking to, because they're grieving. You know, and I, and I I did a couple times, and it never turned out well. People yell at you; they're angry. They they have they want to direct their emotions somewhere, and I felt like it was just wrong. You know what I mean? And you know, don't don't tell on me. <laughs> but you know, those types of certain those, those certain things, um, you know, you'll be able to use those as tools for your next your your next encounter in order to educate yourself and be able to better handle other situations because from that you know being sent on those sensitive stories where people are grieving and I'm still having to get video or sound or something like that you understand you know how to approach situations and how to talk to people just like how you said look I'm not trying to put the mic in your face to ask you what happened who died how do you feel you, you want to be one with your community, so you need to understand them, and you need to be sensitive. So, and you can't do that without feeling your emotions. I have to ask a question. Do you all have a social worker in your organization or on the, at the channel? No, we do have, uh, they have started providing counseling services through benefits, though. Mm -hmm. um, I guess I, th I think sorry. COVID really, uh, mm help okay. them understand because our station did a really good job of getting us out of the news. We went from over a hundred people in the newsroom to five. They, they made us all mobile, but even with the isolation, I think a lot of companies came to understand how much isolation was affecting people and then going out and telling, you know, their stories. 
because you know, I mean, if you're not feeling anything, then there, you know, there's something wrong with you. Like you might come up, I, I can't tell you the amount of inappropriate laughter that would happen in certain stories when you're out as a reporter, because it's the only way you can, yeah, it you, comes you, out weird, yeah, yeah, you can handle it. So we call it a gangbang where like everybody, like all the stations are there. There's some big story. There's some big killing, some big explosion, some big whatever. And you're just waiting. You're waiting for the, you know, ME to come out and say something. You're waiting for the chief of police to say something. So you can be there for hours and you're, you know, killing time. And, you know, you just start making inappropriate jokes and laughing, but it's literally the only way, Protection. yeah, you can navigate, you know, the emotions of, of what you're there. I mean, I was there, I don't know if you guys are even probably too young, um, about the young student, I think she was at Princeton, and she was killed and put into the wall of the science building, and she was just about to, on, yeah, she was just about to get uh, married. And oh my God, we had to stake out her fiance's house. Oh, 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 oh. It was like, come on out. And you know, we'd all just be there and like, it would be like the most inappropriate. I remember I was on a triple homicide that a woman did and we we're all like, really? You never hear of a triple, like a woman, like, and it wasn't shooting. She like stabbed these people. When's the last time you heard of a woman doing that? And then that just turned into like, you know, jokes. And, but you, you do the best you can to protect yourself emotionally. Go. Go, ahead, go. Sorry. No, no, go, go, go. No, I was just going to say um, they do do a good job of when there's traumatic situations bringing in people to the newsroom. Uh, um, when those 20 people died in Skahari in that limousine crash, they brought somebody in for the week. And I remember thinking to myself, you know, because I, I was actually there the first day. I, I wouldn't say we broke it because I think 13 was also on the scene, but I definitely, myself and my photographer were the first people on the scene. And I knew something was wrong the moment I got there. I had never seen officials react the way that they did. I mean, it was almost like they wanted to lift me up off the ground and like throw me to the other side of the street. <laughs> and I was like, this is strange. Um, and, you know, from covering that from day one, learning how many people died, learning how they died, learning how it could have been prevented. Um, and, and then some people in our newsroom were connected to fit, knowing some of the family. I mean, it was a lot. And I was just like, I'm fine. And then I was like, but you know what, maybe I should just go in because I, I know better. And I'm glad I did because that's when you really understand that there, there needs to be that moment where you have to process what is going on. Because that was that was a really big situation, very traumatic, you know. People so. understand the story, is that right? So it was a limousine of twenty people, and oh. it was a wedding or some sort. No. A bridal, it was a, it was a like a bridal trip. People were like a bridal party was in there, and the bride and the right. Kids were near so it was there. like almost you know friends and and almost a whole family was wiped out all at once. Yeah. And then two but, people yeah. in a, pa a parking lot that were just like getting in their car after eating lunch. It's totally avoided. Totally avoidable because they the the way that the limousine was designed, right. they chopped it. It was almost like they chopped the Ford Excursion in half and then just put this big, huge piece of metal in the in the middle. And the the incline of the street that they were going down, the brakes, it wasn't enough. You know, there's still investigations going around it, but that was one of the main things that they said. It should not have been on the road. The inspections failed. The the car shouldn't have been chopped up the way that it was. Um, lots of things. So, yeah. So, one again, the whole idea here among the many is to think very seriously and more broadly around how, what is the intersection, more importantly, mm -hmm. how do social workers conceptualize what social work problems are? And how do we discern, as an advocacy function, how do you utilize tools in the society, inclusive of the media, in the service of the promotion of justice in a civil society, right? And so at the very least, you know now two people who understand and appreciate and would be open to conversations should you have some really terrific idea. Um, I can't overstress this idea about that. You talk about an investigative reporter around this, but we have a whole center on child welfare stuff, um, and we would love to be present to help some of that out. All right, people, so what are your questions? Please have questions. We've been talking forever. I feel like we bored you. Well, 
Our Mercedes goes to the ladies' room. I'll take questions. Do we need a break? Bueller. Five minutes. Bueller. Uh, let's take five. Bueller. Um, to the faculty, and I think on behalf of the students, we're deeply grateful, deeply grateful. <laughs> this idea about you walking up to the person who's most completely different than you and going and, find, and having those conversations, I'm gonna take that away, that's useful for me. Um, the very last thing I will say, and I mean this from my spirit, I asked on purpose whether or not you were born to be on television. The real question was, are you intentionally living out the full manifestation, full manifestation of who you are, I think a whole Albany community will say yes and thank you. So yes and thank you. At 11.40, we have people coming into the room, so we probably need to clear out. And um, do not forget that there is a meet and greet at 12 o'clock. Now, in the courtyard, between Draper, Richardson, and no, Houston. It's in Houston. Um, where is it? In the courtyard, in the courtyard. People, thanks.